All right. Welcome back, guys. Today we have Tara Blair Ball. She's a certified relationship coach and author of Grateful in Love and two new titles coming out in 2022. She specializes in helping clients foster happy, healthy relationships. She holds a master's degree from the University of Memphis, as well as coaching certificates from Transformation Academy and others accredited by the CTAA. She's been featured in the New York Times, Independent TV, and the Daily Mail. Today, she's going to be offering us tips for connecting more with your partner. Welcome, Tara. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. So um, earlier, I was reading some of your stuff, and you talk about how important love rituals are. Can you tell us more about that? What are they, and why are they important? Yeah, so rituals of love are things you do for and or with your partner, every single day, regardless of what's going on. And I tend to sort of focus on, even if you're mad at your partner, that that's the aspect of it is that is something you can do continually. So the benefits of doing rituals of love, and a lot of couples actually do these, they just may not have had a name for them previously. This is just sort of a name I came up with when I was working with clients, but uh, these are things that you do that show that, um, your love isn't just revoked just because you're mad that you still continue to love care and nurture your relationship with your partner. So for example, in my relationship, my husband makes me and brings me coffee every morning and I always make his breakfast the night before. So as soon as he wakes up, he can get that out. And that's something that we do for each other every single day, regardless if we're mad at each other or sleep deprived or sick, it's just ingrained in our relationship. It does help couples repair and reconnect after fights and, you know, feel more connected, feel like we're cared for. Uh, And we all need those kinds of things in our relationship to feel like we're supported and cared for. And these things are small. They're not, not, they shouldn't take a lot of time planning, forethought or energy. You know, when I make his breakfast, it's really quick. When he makes my coffee, that's a really quick thing. But it could also be things like, We, you know, whenever you see one another and greet one another, you kiss as soon as you see each other or give each other a hug, or, you know, you always watch certain TV shows together. So having those kind of things built into your relationship just helps encourage positive habits, connection overall. That's awesome. Great. I love that. So um, you also have a practice that you encourage people to do called the weekly check-in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's actually taken from Dr. John Gottman, who is a, um, you know, a forefront on marriage research and is a well-known and famous marriage therapist, marriage and family therapist. Uh, He calls it a state of the union. Uh, I just call it a weekly relationship check-in and it follows a very specific format. So the first thing you do is you, you know, have a specific time that you do it every single week with your partner. This might be the you know, ideally in person, but you can do it in FaceTime or over text or email, depending on how your life is busy. But ideally you do it the same time every week. So you have it sort of set up, you understand, you prioritize your life around Mm -hmm. it. The first thing you'll do is share five appreciations with one another. So this could be, you looked really hot on Wednesday. Thank you so much for doing the dishes. You're just sharing those things that you appreciate about your partner to your partner. The next thing you do is share five things that have gone well in the previous week. So this could be personally, professionally in your relationship, outside your relationship. Like I had a really good talk with my boss or, you know, so-and-so's baseball game went really well. The third thing you share, which I think is the most impactful is you share with your partner, something that's been bothering you or something you would like to revisit. So you know, 70% of problems that a, that a couple face are unresolvable or perpetual, you know, so they, that just means they may need to be navigated or aired out. Like I was really irritated when blank happened. And this gives us an opportunity to talk about things the first time they bother us instead of waiting until it's the ninth time and we're exploding about it or, we're, you know, we're resentful. And it's also important to recognize that if something is not doesn't feel resolved to one person in the relationship, that means it's not resolved. You know, a fight needs to be resolved to both people. So there might need to be more conversation. There might need to be something, a need met. Um, I recommend the format of, I feel blank about blank and then expressing a need. So I felt really sad that, you know, we didn't get to connect over the weekend. Can we have a date 
night coming up? Or can we do some, schedule something where I really to connect? And the other person's job, this isn't a time for a fight, but the other person's job is to ask clarifying questions, listen, and if a need isn't expressed, ask if a need, if something is needed. And then last thing, we, we share one thing that would help us feel loved in the upcoming week. So that might be like, can you, you know, make me coffee on Friday? Can we have a date night? Anything like that, that would help you feel more connected to your partner. And then ideally both people are going to then follow through with, with a fourth option for each other, but it's a way to sort of deal with issues as they come up instead of letting them become bigger. It also just helps you feel more appreciated and loved in the relationship. So I, I like that. It sounds like it's a way to set aside time specifically for communication. Yeah. Um, what were you saying about 70% uh, of couples problems are, what did you call it? Un Perpetual or unresolvable. Yeah. What does that mean? So a lot of problems that couples might face might have to deal with differences in personalities, differences in upbringing, differences in morals and values. And based on 30 years of research, Dr. John Gottman believes that about 70% of problems are, are perpetual, which means they'll sort of be, they'll sort of can continually come up, you know, and Ooh. that you'll continually need to address them. Like, oh, we, we just, we want to parent our children differently, or, you know, so-and-so mm -hmm. is a, is a, a morning person and I'm a night person. So you just have to sort of, you know, keep navigating them, keep talking about them as they sort of come up. And some problems can be resolved, but we may sort of get it in gridlock around them. So, you know, one person may need to accept that the other person is not really a morning person, or there needs to be some kind of compromise where both yeah. people feel like they win. So it's just about how do I communicate about this? How do we work through this? Cause we're different people, you know, like we're not clones. So how do we deal with these issues? How do we keep moving forward? That makes sense. I, I see perpetual coming back up over and over. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Especially the, um, the example of morning and night people. My husband has that in our relationship, my husband and I, and um, it's one of those things that we've just had to get used to with each other and learn how to work around it. And uh, he's had to learn to be patient with the fact that I get really tired at night and don't have the energy to stay up late. And I have to be patient with the fact that he clicks snooze on his alarm a bajillion times <laughs> in the morning. Our and relationship is the exact same. Yeah. And, and it's like, oh, okay. I can see that. Like that's, that's always going to be there. We're always just going to be different in that way and mm -hmm. have to be patient with each other. That makes sense. And then unresolvable. Um, does he just, what does Dr. Gottman mean about that? Like unresolvable sounds pretty ominous. It does sound ominous. It's really not. Uh, and it really just means there's no going to be, there's not going to be a fix. That's just going to be perfect. And so that's why it may continually come up and sort until you sort of learn to navigate. So you and your husband might fight every single day about the fact that one of you is a morning person and one of you is a night person. So that can continually come up, but it's not going to, and what he means by it being perpetual or unresolvable is, you know, one of you is very, it's very unlikely. One of you is going to just start being a morning person if you're not normally. So it's just that thing that it's just something it's about your two different personalities and learning to come to some acceptance and work through it. So a resolution in his definition is something that's changed and doesn't come back because it's an issue that may keep coming back. Yeah. Because it's an issue that may keep coming back. That makes it perpetual or unresolvable. So it doesn't mean that it's, you know, terrible terrible, you know, it's just yeah. learning to accept those differences in our partner and moving forward. And my husband and I are the same as your husband. We're just reversed. I'm the night person. He's the morning person. And I will never be chipper in the early morning, but he is, <laughs> he pops up. He's like excited, ready for the day. And I need hours to sort of wake up and, you know, and that's just differences in our personality. I love that about him, but that is not me. It's, it's really handy in some situations, like, mm -hmm. like with parenting, we eventually came to this place where like, especially when our kids were toddlers and babies, 
it was like, okay, you take the first shift when you are able to stay up late and then I'll take the second shift. Yeah. And I don't mind getting up at three in the morning as much as I mind staying up till midnight. Like, and it was really handy. But then when it came to being a couple, it can be really challenging, especially when you add family and kids to find time to spend together when for most couples, that time is when your kids are sleeping. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to sleep at different times, it can be challenging, but I see what you mean. Now I, I was thinking unresolvable means like you can't work through it. It'll never get better, but it's not about that. It's just about that. It will continue to come up because it just is, it's just one of the things of the relationship. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So, um, how can couples communicate more clearly? What do you do to help couples with this? Well, part of it is starting a practice like the uh, weekly relationship check-in is like giving a space for that. Cause I think a lot of us get caught up in life and don't really have the time or space to think about what's going on in my life. What issues am I having? You know, how do I figure out how to express this to my partner. So I think it's always a good first step is to have that space to communicate about that. I also mm -hmm. always recommend couples learn just the basics of healthy communication, which is, you know, observe thoughts, feelings, needs, you know, often we think we're expressing uh, a bigger thing, but we're really ignoring what's our, what's our need behind it. So this is from the book, uh, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. So, you know, first you state facts, you know, I've been getting to the dishes more often this week, for example, that's just facts. There's no judgmental language. I'm not expressing anything else. Then you move into thoughts. So that makes me think that, you know, it's expected that I do it or that something else is going on or that I don't feel appreciated or that kind of thing. We move into feelings like I feel exhausted, tired, annoyed, frustrated because I, on top of everything else I do, I've been doing the dishes more this week and I need, which is a deeper, that's always what we need to get to is figure out what need we met, need met in our relationship. So the need in this case might be, you know, I need to feel valued. So I need some appreciation that I'm doing this extra work or I need to feel that things are equal. So can we sit down and have a conversation about division of labor? Like, is this going to be continuing and I need to adjust or, you know, can you take something off the, off my plate? So this doesn't feel so much extra for me. So it's just about learning how to help make our partner less defensive, but also really express what do we actually need around that? You know, what is the deeper, the deeper thing? I like how you have um, like a plan, a structure, so that if you move through this as a couple, it can keep you on track as opposed to getting distracted by other things, stories, thoughts, emotions, past. Just, I really <laughs> like that. This plan helps keep on track when maybe you're discussing something that's hard, that has a lot of emotion or feeling around it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And that's how I had to learn how to communicate better because I really struggled with this for a long time. So it's it's really about just finding a system that works for you and your partner because a lot of us didn't learn healthy relating skills. And so it's something it's a, something that we have to learn in practice, which practice is really the hardest part is how do I do this on a regular basis? And when life gets messy or I am angry like, or escalated, like you mentioned, it's like, how do I just, what can I do to help bring myself back in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like that. And also it's a skill. So the more you practice it, the easier and more natural it'll flow and it won't feel um, so stunted or mm -hmm. like halting, like, okay, now I've said this, what's next? Like once you practice, I'm sure it just becomes much easier. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. Did you have any other tips that you like to share with your clients? Um, I have a lot. <laughs> so I also recommend that couples really look at their fighting and how it'll better learn how to do conflict resolution. So I recommend that couples do um, what's generally called a fair fighting agreement. So this is where 
you as a couple, or really you individually consider what are the behaviors that are unacceptable when I fight and how can I stop those behaviors? So first is just listing them all out. So it might be yelling, name calling, blaming, shutting down or the silent treatment, um, you know, other avoidance tactics where you just, you don't want to talk about it. Um, maybe lack of focus. So, you know, you're talking about one thing and then your partner gets angry about something else. So not bringing up multiple incidents at once, you know, we're very multitasking is a lie for most of us. So staying focused. Um, and most, most people need some kind of way to sort of get off whatever track they're following on. So if you are in a pattern with your partner where you continually yell, that's going to feel normal and second nature to you that when we're, when we're angry at each other, we're going to yell. So if you want to try something different, there needs to be something that breaks that pattern. And for many couples, it is a time out. So ideally you'll need 30 to 60 minutes to calm down. And the way you would initiate that is to say something like, I need a timeout. Let's talk in 30 to 60 minutes. And then you can physically leave. Uh, you can walk away, but you do not talk, text, engage, any of that. And you take a break. And then when that time is up, you come back. If you're still feeling escalated, you can give another time like, hey, I I need, you know, I need another hour, but ideally you'll resolve fights within 24 hours. Some kind of resolution needs to happen within 24 hours. If you're waiting 24 hours, you forget what you're mad about, you know, and then you, you're just dragging something out unreasonably. Um, but a lot of couples need sort of need that to sort of stop behaviors. I think it's also important to note that the difference between a boundary and a request so I could tell my partner, don't yell at me. But the way I make that a boundary is I say, I will not participate in conversations where there is yelling. Okay. So that's the boundary because I can only control my behavior. I can't control what my partner does. So that means if my partner yells, I will not participate. That means if my partner yells, I do not yell back. I don't even respond calmly. I just will not participate. It also means that I'm not yelling at my partner first off, okay? Because that's my boundary. I'm not going to participate in conversations where there's yelling. So that means I have control and choice over my own behaviors in a fight or in any kind of conflict with anyone that I can choose what I'm okay with or not. And it doesn't matter what my partner does, but I can make the choice to participate or not. Yeah, that's actually the very next question I was going to ask. You went right into it. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, that's, um, that, and that takes some thought and self-reflection, I would think, because if you're setting a boundary, it's something that you want to be serious about in that you want to make sure you actually mean it because boundaries are not the same thing as threats right. or punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what it's about. Yeah. So um, we have a little time left. I want to get to your free gift, how to yeah. create rituals of love with your partner. Can you tell us more about that? That's what you have to offer for our listeners. It's really generous of you to offer a gift. Yeah. So I, I love helping couples with rituals of love in your relationship. So this little, this little download will help you figure out what are the rituals of love that you currently have in your relationship. So being mindful of what do I already love doing for, for my partner and what do they love doing for me? What can I, and what can I continue to do even if I'm mad at them or even if they're mad at me? And can, can I have a conversation with my partner about that? Like, can we agree to continue to do this to show that our love for each other isn't revoked just because we're mad or whatever. And then there's lots of examples of ones that you can start doing in your relationship or ones you might want to add. The thing I do mention in the download and I'll mention it here as well is you have to choose rituals of love that feel authentic to you as well as could feel authentic to you despite what's happening mm. so for example if you feel like it would be impossible to kiss your your partner goodbye knowing that you're mad at them don't make that a ritual of love yeah. you know do a hug or a high five yeah. instead or you know, cause some people have the qualm of like, well, it feels forced or not authentic. You know, I get that. Choose ones that would feel authentic to you. Mm -hmm. You know, like regardless of how mad I might be at my husband, I still make his breakfast the night before and I can make it, you know, I can make it with really angrily if I want, but I'm still doing that action. And that action is both for you and your partner. 
right? So even if you're mad at your partner, you are still showing that you personally care about your partner, makes you think positively about your relationship. And it also helps them feel good because they know that you've chosen to do this regardless. Yeah. Consistency. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, thank you so much for stopping in today and giving us your tips, being a part of the panel. Really appreciate it. Let us know where can people find you? They want to work with you. Yeah. So I am on both. Yeah. I'm on both Instagram and TikTok. You can find me at, at Tara dot relationship coach and relationship coach is coach is one word. You can also find me on my website at Tara relationship coach.com. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. Yeah.